let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about? Welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, the founder, and my mother lived with dementia for 30 years, so I'm really passionate about this topic. If you liked our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, and you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bite. We like to have real conversations, and we take about an hour to dive deep. Our goal is to raise everyone's voice from those diagnosed to those who care, to those who serve and support them, to researchers, movie directors, singers, songwriters, you name it, we wanna hear from you. We're all in this together. To our listeners, I always say thank you. I love you so much. Your likes, your clicks, your shares have really broadened our brand footprint all around the world. And I know you're really gonna enjoy today's show when we talk about the film Determined. And some of you may not be aware that uh, October is uh, Louis Body Awareness Month. Let me tell you about a couple of shows we've got uh, coming up. We're gonna be talking with IBM, who is gonna really focus on artificial intelligence, known as AI in Alzheimer's disease. I can't wait for that conversation. Some of our past shows, we had uh, Aaron Blight with us who talked about caregiving, you know, what happens when it knocks on your door. Uh, we had Val from Australia who's living with dementia. And we had Immune Bio and Amika talk about some of their research as well. All of our shows are archived and we've been doing this since uh, 2011. So there's plenty for you to listen to. There is also a new program out and it's called the Wednesday Wave and it's going to run from October 14th through December 16th and you can find more out about that by going to vamostheater.co.uk and then just go to their tab that's Arts in Projects. Dementia Action Alliance known as DAA, has come out with a new online program. And they say Zoom isn't just for meetings anymore, it's for engagement. So it's for people living with dementia who are at home. And they also have a program for people in assisted livings and, and uh, memory care. So go to daanow.org and you'll find out more information about that. I also want to give a shout out to Artist Senior Living in um, Woodbury, Minnesota. They have launched a new memory cafe called The Artist Way. And our next meeting is November 18th. It was the third Wednesday of every month. And their meetings are virtual. You can get more information by contacting them at 612 200 0506 at 612-200-0506. And Arthur's Memory Cafe has also gone virtual. We were one of the first uh, cafes in the country here. And we meet on the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month at one o'clock. And you can just reach out to me for more information on that. We also have some exciting news and we're just kind of doing teasers on this, but um, I'm just going to read this to you because we're launching a new program November 10th, which is just in three weeks. So does the thought of dementia disturb you to the point where you're losing sleep? Or maybe it just sidetracks your mind all day long. Well, we believe that it helps to get through those tough times when you're feeling supported. And we know that's what this new program is gonna do. So 
please watch for our big rollout November 10th. And you won't be able to miss it no matter how hard you try because uh, we're very, very excited about this. I also want to mention MDVIP's Brain Health Quiz. You can find information on that by just going to alzheimerspeaks.com. It's right on our main page. And a big shout out to Coro Health. That's C-O-R-O -O Health. They're still allowing people during COVID to download two of their apps, Music First and also Coral Faith. And the last, I'm going to shout out to the Memory Cafe directory. Uh, Dave has just done a phenomenal job. It now has cafes in five different countries, and it breaks out which ones are now virtual. Last, we're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker, and then we will be back to talk with the ladies of Determined. The Foot Bar Walker was designed not only to assist the patient, but also the caregiver. It's like having a portable pull bar everywhere you go. Patients have more control of their motion and pain management, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. Caregivers, put your foot down and quit hurting your own health. No matter which side of the Foot Bar Walker you're on, it's a win-win. Call 731-924-4444 and visit our factory showroom in Paris, Tennessee, or visit us online at thefootbarwalker.com. Well, I'm so excited to introduce uh, you two to our, to our audience here on Alzheimer's Speaks. I'm, I'm really excited about having this conversation today. And Therese Berry Tanner is the producer of the film called Determined, which has been her idea since 2011. And uh, Teresa and I have gone back quite a few years. Um, her mother died of Alzheimer's disease, just like mine did. I, I never had the tenacity to pursue putting together a film. And this is a pretty uh, dynamic view into families dealing with dementia. Therese, like I said, has really spearheaded this whole, uh, this whole process from funding and getting all the legal clearances <laughs> that are necessary. And she's the creative producer and just a, a real integral storyteller in this whole film and is part of the editing process as well. Prior to, to stepping into this role of film, she worked in healthcare. And she's got over 30 years of um, program management. So she didn't step into it blindly, but she might argue with me <laughs> on that one because the, the film industry, I'm sure, is quite a bit different than, than the healthcare industry. So welcome, Therese. How are you doing today? Thank you, Lori. Um, great to be here. I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for, um, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. So next, I want to introduce you to Melissa Godoy, and she is a director, a cinematographer, and an editor. And she was a line producer for the 2019 Oscar-winning documentary featuring American Factory on Netflix. She also worked on its prequel, The Last Truck, as well. So she is, she's very familiar with the whole film industry and what the heck is going on there. And Melissa's directing includes a feature documentary about creative aging called Do Not Go Gently, which aired on PBS for 12 years. That's kind of an incredible run. And with the support of the Ohio Arts Council on Arts and Learning Program, she also directed two fictional films with residents and staff at an Alzheimer's daycare prior to embarking on this film called Determined. So welcome, ladies. Like I said, this is going to be a fun, <clears throat> a very fun conversation. Now, before we get into our line of questioning, I always like to ask my guests so my audience has some kind of base on have you been touched in your own family or circle of friends with dementia? And Teresa, if you could just give us just a little bite because you know, you're know you part of this film, so. Well, yes, um, in the uh, early 2000s, my mother developed Alzheimer's disease and I was part of that journey um, with my dad. And you know, from the very beginning, trying to figure out what was wrong going to the first medical appointments, the neurologist, et cetera. Um, and then the, you know, the slow progression of the disease that 
picked up its pace, you know, over time. And all those, all those different steps and the increasing difficulties um, my father had in caring for her, you know, at home with help from me and often my siblings, you know, would visit as well. Um, so we, we were touched uh, during that time to where it, you know, got to a point um, where my father just could not take care of her anymore. And we had to look for a nursing home and we were proactive, which, you know, is a, is a difficult thing when you're, you're caught at the 11th hour. Um, but we, we managed through it. And uh, um, so that's, that's, that's how I got acquainted with the disease head on. That's how most of us do when it comes to dementia. It just, uh, it doesn't come quietly, you know, and softly in the night. It just kind of hits you over the head and uh, changes your world and changes everybody in the family's world and friends. Melissa, how about you? Have you been touched personally in your own family or circle of friends by somebody with dementia? Well, uh, yes, I have many friends with parents who have dementia, but, and in my own family, my grandmother, one of my favorite people in the world, near, near the end of her life, she had some kind of dementia. I don't know that it was Alzheimer's, but it was, a, it was a dementia that definitely changed her perception of reality. But in the experience, actually in my creative life, I have been very close to many people with dementia, um, working on, the, especially on this project in the nursing home with um, one woman who actually became one of our sound people. She's a nurse. And she and I worked together to do some um, filmmaking with people in her creative daycare. So I got to hang out with them for years and we spent many hours laughing and enjoying life. And I found that dementia can actually be a joyful time if, if people, the caregivers have support and it's approached with some understanding. So it's, it was a dementia friendly community. So I was very fortunate to experience that. Okay, great. I'm, I love that you mentioned the joy because it's definitely there to be had, but you're only going to find what you're looking for. And um, a lot of times I, I believe we don't teach people to look for that or to even believe that it's possible. So Teresa, I'm going to start with you first. Um, making an independent film was very different from what you did prior in healthcare, I'm sure. And I know that it's been a long journey and it, my guess is it was a difficult one as well. I mean, 2011, we're almost coming up on 10 years, you know, from this concept in your, in your brain, in your heart. And that commitment is, you know, I mean, just something to really give you a pat on the back for, because a lot of people would have walked away and said, there's a little bit more work than I planned on. I don't think I'm going to go here. What drew you to really decide, you know, I'm, I'm crossed the line. I want to tell this story. That's a great question. A, a few years after my mother passed away, be around 2010 to into 2011, I got the idea to try to tell the story of the disease through the eyes of being a research participant and a caregiver, because I thought it was a different way of approaching telling the story in terms of, and I, and I wanted it to be visual. So documentary film was the visual part. And the thought in my head was that through three stories of people in that research study and their experience as caregiving, we would get a window into the disease from both a caregiver perspective, but also a research participant perspective and what's going on in the science of the disease. So that was my original concept back in 2011. I didn't know anything about filmmaking. I was able to work with a gentleman who gave me some first initial steps um, in the spring of 2011, do some research about other documentaries that had done, been done, et cetera. And after I met with him in August, he said, this is a good idea. And I was a little surprised. And uh, he said, but I can't help you with this. And he sent me on my merry way. So that's that was the inception. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Melissa, how about you? What drew you in? How did you two connect? Well, Therese called me and she had received a re reference actually from my mother who is also one of the producers, Eileen Liddick. She, she, Therese and Eileen were talking. And of course my mother knew that I was 
in the thick at the moment of doing this project with people in an Alzheimer's daycare. So I was completely in that world of, of knowing people with Alzheimer's disease and loving them really. And, and she knew, and also my documentary experience where it was at that time, she, she knew that I would really be interested in this. And so Therese called me and it didn't take any time for me to see that what she was talking about was indeed a very good idea. I was intrigued by the notion, first of all, it's a really interesting um, perspective because these are people, the people who are in a study, they actually have some power to make change. It's not a helpless feeling, right? So, and um, the world of, you know, families, I thought, I, I love families. That's to me, the most interesting thing about documentary storytelling is to tell it through relationships. So we have relationships just all through this story and it's pretty much everyone is different. And because of our observational method, we just observe just the story is told through their relationships, you know, and it's really about, to me, the story is, is about Alzheimer's disease research, but it's also about the resilience of families and relationships and how some of them can endure and come out, you know, with wisdom and, and gratefulness and joy and how challenging it really is to, to all of them. Yeah. I just knew that there was going to be an adventure on the horizon. And then once, once we started meeting the people, I was just sucked in because it said in my home state, Wisconsin, I feel like these are my people. It was quite enjoyable. Kind of the perfect storm. Yeah. Of, yeah. of everything coming together. So I think what we should do is just take a peek at the trailer right now so that everybody can kind of be on the same page. And I, I think the audience is going to be as wowed and interested as, as I have been um, with this process because uh, Teresa has been kind of sharing it with me as, as she's gone. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we'll come right back and regroup and dive a little deeper. I can remember being at my mother's one time she held her hand and she said, oh, I think I'm going crazy. I just think I'm going crazy. I can't remember anything. And we said, oh, mother. Hi, mama. Imagine seeing someone wither away. They don't know when to go to the bathroom, how to walk. I was giving her a drink of water one day and she choked. We all panicked. The girls, they all said, well, dad, how are you going to take care of her? Just let dad do it. I was alone. I'm trying to deal with my mom, trying to get my son to school. Stress was part of my life, everyday life. Yeah. We're looking at a silent process. All Alzheimer's is not going to back down, and neither should we. People with a parental family history are two and a half times more likely to get the disease themselves. I have lately thought, you know, you got about another 10 years of memory left before you hit your mom's stage. They told me about the study and I said, oh, sign me up. We ask for a name of someone who can speak for you if you lose capacity. This study is about adult children of people who have Alzheimer's disease. We bring our participants in in midlife and we follow them as they age. Take a breath and hold it. It was one of the first to actually look at the adult caregiver, um, the adult child. So if I were to ask you to be a part of our research study, what would your thoughts be? I probably wouldn't be, you know, we as African Americans are skeptical about research. Mm -hmm. We haven't had any past history of good fortune in research. We still have the issue around Tuskegee. The federal government was experimenting with 430 local black men who had contracted syphilis. They were used as human guinea pigs. Even though we know folks don't want to be involved, we know we have to be involved. I was going to really remember that one, but I don't. I'm noticing that things start to get really confused, and I can't track it anymore. This was the beginning. This was the beginning of, of, of the end. Good. Right there. Sure. We are going to be working you real hard before you 
pass out? Well, hopefully not. A diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease does not mean a death sentence. You can still have quality of life. Ooh, look at those pretty eyes. Well, look at that. Yeah. She is in there after all. If it hits my mom, I just want to have that care that I could just give it to her. We can identify Alzheimer's disease 20 years ahead of time. This is tremendously important because it tells us that there may be an avenue of slowing down this disease in midlife, or in fact, preventing it entirely. This is quantum leaps. That is huge. We got quite a family. Are you ready? I'm ready. So boy, was that cool. Uh, what was that like for you guys to see your trailer, you know, and, uh, and, and say, you know, this piece is done. Um, and Melissa, I'm going to start with you and then, and then go to Therese. That's funny word done because it's never really done. You just sort of say, okay, that's as much time as we have. So it, this is really the first trailer. We know we're going to actually make a shorter trailer and trailer for other purposes. This is our festival trailer. And we worked with a wonderful editor, Jamie Schlenk, who uh, provided a nice energy and a nice perspective. Um, having edited this whole thing, I was worn out. And we had wonderful assistant editors along the way, but after a while, you just, you know, you need a fresh, fresh energy and fresh perspective. So she spent a lot of time just picking through it. The first version was 15 minutes and then it kept shrinking till now it's just under four minutes. Um, it was exciting to see. Yeah. She made hard decisions. Well, and you must have hours of footage that you have to dig through in order to pull something like this together too, I would imagine. And that's got to be, I wouldn't even know where to start you know, with all of that. So um, I can I can see where that would definitely be, be a process. Therese, what does it mean uh, to you to see the first trailer out? It is ex exciting because the trailer is something that a lot of people can see ahead of seeing the whole film. And so we get to put it places and finally have something to show people even if they haven't seen the full film. So it is very exciting. It's a great tool. And I agree, Jamie did a great job. I, I was excited about kind of the pace. Um, and, and, and like Melissa, after working on it for so long, you can lose perspective. And Jamie definitely brought, brought a fresh perspective and I think uh, has made it a, a, an exciting, an exciting piece of work that will push the desire in people to want to see more. That's how I feel about it. And, and you know, after Ben being involved for so long, that's, you know, that's saying a lot. It, it really, she did a great job. So um, I think it's a great way to help us give people a visual who may not see the full film for a while. It's, it's a really good way of introducing them to what this is all about. Yeah, I kind of related to having a baby and it's first time you're taking it outside all dressed up to meet everybody, you know, and what do you think? You know, we've been talking about this for nine months, you know, we're having a baby, we're having a baby and now it's here, except yours has been a 10 year process of talking about this concept and, and bringing it to, to fruition. Uh, Teresa, why don't you talk about the creative approach that you used in terms of telling the story and editing, because there's there's so many different approaches that you can have. So Therese, why don't you just tell us what your, what your thoughts were and did they, did it change over time too? Did you think maybe we're going to tell it this way? And then Melissa came in and said, no, maybe we should try this or this or that. And, and I mean, cause I know I wouldn't even know where to start or what, what are the options? I mean, I wouldn't have a clue. Right. And I didn't have a lot of background. I did you know, I'd been a fan of documentaries and I had watched some documentaries that are told in this style, but I didn't know much. And it was really um, Melissa who brought forth the creative approach, um, explaining that um, telling these stories in a way where the viewer watches the action as it unfolds is really the most compelling way and there are other documentaries that do well and, and reach people that are told in more of an interview-based uh, style or with a lot of, you know, footage. 
but that's like a whole different type of documentary. In the independent world, um, the style is more this following the action as it unfolds. So I really took my cues from Melissa, who has a long a career in documentary filmmaking. And the way she expressed it to me back at the time is that we will follow the characters on their journey. We will be a fly on the wall and watch what's going on in their lives and as they participate in research. That was um, just an amazing concept to me, even though I had seen it just the way she described it. And I knew, I knew that, that that would definitely be the way we should proceed. And being a fly in the wall when you've got a crew and a big camera and probably lights is probably no no easy task to try to get everybody to not notice you and and be real. Um, Melissa, was there anything A that you wanted to add to Teresa's comment? And then two, how do you get people to feel comfortable with you know this crew in their life now, in their living room, you know, in their doctor's appointment, wherever it is? I mean that. That isn't normal. I know on the show here, I get a lot of people both on radio when I do video and they are just so nervous and, you know, and yet time flies by, you know, they, they get comfortable and in sync with things. But, you know, if you're not interacting so much and you are just kind of being that fly on the wall observing, how do they just forget? Cause you're so quiet. Yeah, no, that's a good <laughs> question. Because, well, first of all, we only, we did a it was a very complicated process, actually, even to find this, the people who would be in the film, because we couldn't just ask them because there is this um, privacy issue. They're in a study. So we worked with the study and they volunteered essentially themselves. And then we auditioned, actually, Therese pre-called them and sort of pre-auditioned to find out their stories. Then we went to their homes and we filmed them. That was sort of an audition. But and so we got more of their stories. We hadn't intended to use our audition footage, but we ended up using a lot of it anyway. But the point being is we only would have used people who were very comfortable with us and really understood just the just ignore us thing. If they were self-conscious of the camera, it just we knew it would not work. So that that was that was part of it. They just had to totally agree to just access that we would be, you know, allowed access. And of course, they have always the right to say no, don't we, you know, we had a day we really wanted to film. And it was a very tough day for one of our characters. And she said, No, you know, don't come, you know, it, it was too hard. So we, of course, respect that privacy, but we mostly wanted to work with people who were very open. And we could just fit right in. And as far as a crew, our crew was very small. We in when we were in Spooner, we were only two people at a time, just Teresa and me. Because we wanted to basically sort of blend in with the family. And basically, if you work quietly and you're there long enough, they just become bored with you anyway. And you, <laughs> you just do what you have to do. And when we were in the hospital, we had more people. And there were a few times we actually had a, a excellent lighting gaffer because we needed lights. And sometimes we needed some extra things. Sometimes we did have another person for interviewing. Okay. Sometimes um, I leaned at some of the interviewing. Sometimes Chandra, one of our amazing sound recordist did the uh, interview sometimes Therese did. So we had other people when needed, but only when needed. We had another associate producer, Joe Hillman, who helped arrange things too. But basically we tried to stay nimble, small and carry our stuff. You know, we had like whatever we could carry. It wasn't like a big, you know, fiction film where we'd have a grip truck and you know, backup beepers and everything. And the other thing is you have to stay quiet. You have to talk quietly. You can't even bring attention to yourself very much. Um, so that was that was our approach. And as, what was the other question? I forgot you asked. Oh, you asked if I wanted to. Oh, the approach, right. Yeah. So one of the things we were trying to avoid is, you know, like we did want to avoid a narrator, you know. So the whole story had to be told through scenes. Ideally, as much verite scene as possible, but it wasn't possible to tell the whole story that way. We tried, but you still need to lean once in a while on some interviews. So fortunately, the interviews were very good. So the interviews do help structure and help us know what's going on and help us know what's inside people's feelings, you know, which you can't always get. Or things that happened in the past, because remember, we're following present day. We're following things as they unfold. So if something happened in the past, we need to get that from an interview or photos. And then the, the substitute for narration, 
is text on screen. So no, the, there was an interesting balance of like, when you use text, you want to say as much as possible in as few words and not confuse people, not introduce a tangent. There are many things we had to edit out that just, you know, had a tangent, a number maybe, or a scientific word that's unnecessarily confusing. And we figured, oh, we could still get the point without using that word. So it was always a matter of simplifying, so cutting it down to the bone. But then the scenes, we wanted them to play out, to be immersive. There was a balance there too. Sometimes it was too, they were too long, you know, so we'd had, you know, so there was always, it's all about balance and the experience of viewing. Yep. Oh, I can, I can understand that. Um, now, Melissa, one of the things I want to ask you, because unlike, you know, Therese, who lived through, you know, a, a personal journey with Alzheimer's disease, what did you learn about uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia while making the film? I definitely learned some things. Um, with the family in Spooner, I really did not know that Alzheimer's disease can cause such physical incapacitation because Irene in, in Spooner, Wisconsin, she was really at a very end stage, which I hadn't witnessed. Mm -hmm. In the Alzheimer's daycare that I worked at, they were more early stage and physically able, you know, much more, not completely, but she, I didn't realize that swallowing is a extremely important issue. That was a revelation to me. And then also I learned through, um, Karen's story, how much, not only does Alzheimer's disease, you know, you can think of it as past generations, it's affected your grandparents, etc. but how much it can affect future generations just because of the, the demands of time and how decisions have to be made. And in even the kind of sensitivity that can come out of that young people can develop more sensitivity toward other people by being in a family with Alzheimer's disease. Or even I would imagine the fear of, am I going to get it? I know that that crosses family members' minds a lot. You know, how about you, Therese? Did you learn anything through this process? Even though, you know, you walk the journey and stuff, every family, you know, goes through it just a little bit different. I'm going to just take the question and maybe twist it just a bit. If we talk about Alzheimer's more in general, there's two things, you know, like the Alzheimer's world. There's two things I learned. One, is that in terms of the research side of it, there aren't enough people of color in research and it's a problem. And uh, I didn't realize that until we got into this story and the woman who runs the outreach in Milwaukee for the research study, it was really, a, it was really eye-opening and why, why that exists as well. So, and then the other thing I learned in terms of communicating with like-minded groups to help support us along the journey, find out what was happening in the world of Alzheimer's, I learned about the, the um, it was maybe in its early stages or mid stages when I became aware of it, but the dementia friendly community movement, which Melissa described in terms of what she did at that day program, but communities across the nation um, working with government service providers, businesses, and people involved in Alzheimer's to make communities more welcoming for people and their families. Because when I went through the process with my dad and my mom, we felt like we had no place we could go outside of the home. And it was very isolating, not just for her, but for all of us. So I, those are some things I learned that were very eye-opening. Um, and especially on the second one, just it was wonderful. And that movement has continued to grow. And you've been a part of that too, Lori. I know in your community, you're part of one of those groups and they just do su such great work and they're just an asset to the people that are affected by the disease. Well, and one thing you might not know is actually I launched the first dementia-friendly community in the nation, in Wisconsin, <laughs> in Watertown. Watertown was the first one. And uh, that was thanks to the Lutheran Home Association believing in it. I talked with the uh, executive director at the time, Michael Klatz, and we met over several months. And then finally he said, okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an hour with my staff. Come on down to Belle Plains in, in Minnesota. And he says, if you can convince them, we're off and running. So I go down there and I'm, I'm, I'm all excited and I'm nervous as heck, you know, to do this. 
And I start talking and I'm probably 10 or 15 minutes in and, and Michael stops me. And I just think, oh, I blew it. How did I blow it in 10 or 15 minutes? I mean, that's what's going through my head and he's kicking me out the door. That's what I'm thinking. And he's like, Lori, look at them. They're in. No more pitching. Let's just talk. How are we going to do this? And so Wisconsin has been so progressive and really it's been so fun to see all the memory cafes, you know, uh, that uh, the McFadden's had started in their movement and the, the dementia friendly communities really getting the government support and, and stuff. Uh, it was, it was incredible, but they were all so eager to hear about, you know, what is it, what is this and how are you doing this? And we've been talking about this for two years and we still don't have our, our mission statement carved out. And I'm like, kick it to the curb and just go, just start, you know, and, and let it unfold. And that's what you guys are doing with the film. You're just letting real life unfold and, and telling a true authentic story. And to me, that is the most powerful way to make change is to let the authentic voices of people say what they have to say, because it's, it's really pulling back the curtain on something that is so hidden. And I know our family did it. We didn't really let everybody know what it was really like. And we thought that was dignified. And it's like, well, dignified, schmignified, you're not going to get any help if nobody knows, <laughs> you know, you have to, you have to tell the story. So Therese, I want to ask you, what are your plans moving forward? I know you've been in, in some of the film festivals. So what have you been in? Is there one coming up and, and how can people see the film? So the, the whole way to birth a documentary is very complicated, <laughs> um, more complicated than I would have imagined, but one of the one of the ways you can take is to apply and have the film seen at film festivals where you can um, you know get some interest and traction and sometimes distributors go to festivals if you're lucky you might get good press so we we're on the festival journey and we have few that we are applying to but in terms of what we've been able to achieve and and get into so far the first festival we were we got into in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Film Festival, got canceled due to COVID um, in the spring. That was a little disappointing, but we we moved on, and we are going to now premiere at a festival in Southern Utah called Doc Utah in the first week of November. So that will be our first you know grand launch where people attending that festival will be able to see the full film. We also are fortunate to have been accepted into the Raw Science Film Festival. It's a newer festival about a very, and a very passionate woman uh, leading the charge of that festival. It's out in Los Angeles. And she's been, she's very committed to having the festival in person. So she's delayed it until the first week of February. So we are uh, selected for that. We have applied to some others for the spring of next year, and um, hopefully we'll be in a few more. Um, we'll also be teeing up community screenings in places where we aren't really going to be in a festival. And um, we are at the same time starting our journey to look for distribution. And Melissa can probably talk a little bit more about those last two, but that's kind of the broad brush. So 2021 is going to be a very busy year. <laughs> Given COVID gets out of the way. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Melissa, why don't you go ahead and add on to that? Uh, the film festivals, you know, I've heard so many people do that and I have heard how complicated it is and how costly it is too. put in an application. And then, you know, if you get accepted going out there, I mean, it's stuff people I think just don't really think about a lot of times in terms of, of getting your work um, out in, in force, but, um, but yet there seems to, it seems to be a really good way in order to, to raise awareness of, of the work that you've done. So um, feel free to, to add on um, to the question, you know, where do you go moving forward and how, how did you feel the process was? Um, yeah, well, we, what we would like to do is get the film seen by people who want to see it. We know there is a large population hungry viewers who want to see this movie and it's just a matter of right now our festival our festival run is to, to 
basically just come out, be birthed and get some exposure and have more fun like we're having with you talking about it. Like you're one of the first people we've actually had this sort of public discussion about it, which is we'll do more of this. And then, um, but eventually we need to find a distributor who can help get this film into the living rooms of people who want to see it. And that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I, I worked with a, a film and um, it's called A Timeless Love. And we did a lot of the community screenings. And one of the reasons we chose that was we were able to then have a talk back and connect people to resources. Because one of the things I was a little scared of was what if they don't watch the whole thing? What if they don't get to the, the joyful part and the, the, the place that allows you to breathe? You know, what if they cut off halfway through and go, oh, I just can't do that. Or what if that hits us or we're going down this path and then they just turn it off? You know, I didn't want to add to, to the stress. So I think the community screenings are wonderful. Yet I, I still, to this day, we get a lot of people going, where can we, where can we get the, the DVD? You know, can we, can we stream this? And, and so I, I still, you know, and we don't, we're not doing that with this particular film. Um, and I don't know if we made the right decision or not, you know, in that process, but I know how powerful the community events were because people said, it was just nice to know I'm not alone. You know, they just felt comfortable in those seated with perfectly, you know, strange people. And some of them were telling stories that they'd never told anybody before. And, you know, to me, that's a miracle in and of itself for people to feel that comfortable and that connected and that accepted um, in that, in that world. Um, it, so it's just, uh, it's amazing what film can do, because I think it takes people back because they're like, well, we're going to the movies, you know, and then we're like, whoa, we just went to the movies. We need to have a conversation. We got to talk. I got to process this. There was a, this was real life stuff, you know, and how can, how can I help with all of that? Um, for distribution, do you have ideas in mind? Are you like thinking Netflix or DVDs or HBO or, you know, um, public stations or? Yeah, we, we, we are just beginning that, I, you know, probably not DVDs because they're not as, you, some place, people don't even have DVD players anymore. Some, some don't. but streaming maybe, and some broadcast network of some kind. So that's what we're toying with. And I mean, even before uh, broadcast or streaming, yes, we do want to do community screenings for exactly the reason you just described. I mean, it's very empowering to be with an audience. It's, it's an amazing experience to watch the film with an audience and discuss it and come out more enriched. So if people just watch it on their own, you know, they can read more about it or they can have their own feelings, but you to really make change happen, it, it's um, an audience is what you really want, ideally. Yeah. Well, and I think the power of film too, and I, I showed the one that we were doing down in Texas. I think we were in Texas. And one of my, you know, deals is, you know, we have to have a room where it, you can darken the room. And they, they put me in this room that was, had all this upper lighting and, you know, natural light and we couldn't darken the room. And so the screen was almost white. I mean, and I'm dying and I'm like, I go up, you know, to the executive director and I'm like, um, I, I can pivot, you know, I can do a program here. And he, he just looked and he's like, look at them look at them. They are engaged. They are hanging on every single word. And to me, that was just incredible that they could listen to the story. They didn't even need the visuals because the story was so powerful. And people came up afterwards going, oh no, because I was still questioning, did we do the right thing? And they were like, no, that was, you know, and I was like, wow. I mean, it just gave me a whole nother realm of respect for film, you know, because we're always looking at, you know, the beauty and, you know, how it, how it unfolds. But again, it's the, the, the words and the authentic voices of your people living everyday lives, you know, and trying to adapt and learn and adjust through this too, that are just going to really ping at people's hearts as well. And then the, the hope of, you know, the studies and the research and, 
and things that you guys dive into as well is, is really, really cool. I have one more thing that's, that's important just in ter terms of community. Um, we were quite conscious of our crew, like our crew has experience with Alzheimer's disease. Everybody from Therese, um, the one woman I mentioned who ran that creative daycare, Amy Krepp was a sound person. Our impact producer, Karen Durgan, she, she saw her mother and her stepfather both through end of life with Alzheimer's. And actually Amy Krepp saw her father through end of life with Alzheimer's disease. Joe Hillman, our associate producer, is also in the study. And we were, so we were like, we are the community. I mean, I had mostly my experience with, you know, people in the dementia friendly world, but we were that community. It wasn't like we were sh filming something that was strange to us. So I think that actually helped with the intimacy of the storytelling. And when we take it on the road, we are, you know, we are all the same. We are the same as the people in the audience and the same as the people on camera and behind the camera. We're, we all care and we all want to make a difference. So that's, that's just, I guess, the authenticity of what we attempted to do. Wonderful. Therese, go ahead. I just want to add, I don't want to leave our production assistant out. Um, Jean Wentz oh, also, yeah. uh, lost her father to Alzheimer's. So really, really uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a team who all have, back to your original question, how have you been touched? We all were touched. And I think Melissa made an excellent point but I didn't want to leave Jean out. Yes, thank you. That's good. And, yeah. and another interesting point is we were almost entirely, except for the post-production process and our lighting gaffer, a female crew. Oh, wow. So, yeah, we were super female, super women, because uh, this disease touches women more than men. And we didn't feel, we felt completely empowered to tell this story, put it that way. Now we had some excellent men in the, in the end stages of color correcting and sound design and uh, our lighting person, but that was about it. We were all female powered. Wow, well, that's, that's fun. Um, Therese, uh, how would you like the film to make a difference in the world? What's, what's your end goal? Well, I've had a lot of time to think about this and looking back in the beginning, um, I was thinking about widening the awareness because I felt that unless you were touched by this disease, you didn't really understand it. And I think even to this day, there's some of that, although more, many more people have friends and relatives, but there's still a stigma attached to the disease after all this time. So I, I believe that um, we need to get people that aren't touched on board with awareness to help be part of the solution in, in whatever way possible, whether, whether that's you know the dementia friendly community movement, participating in a clinical trial. So, so I also feel that for those who are touched that they will in viewing the film feel that they're not alone. And I, that, that can be a powerful experience. And as we look to one of the things that's important about documentaries is, is you want, other than awareness, which is what I just mentioned, you want people to take action. You want people to do something different in their lives because of seeing your film. So we've worked as a team to try to figure out what those goals would be in light of where we are with Alzheimer's. And here are a couple of them. Um, one is to you know, help promote the dementia friendly community movement, um, which we talked about at length. Um, another one of those goals is to get people to understand that re the research is really important and we can't get to the solutions unless people volunteer for research. And so that, that's, um, you know, definitely uh, part, part of our goal. And one of the things that has come out in the film, and we, you've also heard it in the news, is that a healthy lifestyle can make a difference potentially in dementia and Alzheimer's. Maybe not 
you know, maybe not, you know, we're not talk, talking complete cure by, by any means, but maybe staving it off for a number of years. So when we think about everything we've learned um, on the medical front about, you know, what you do for a healthy heart, well, those same, same things are being pointed out for a healthy brain. And if we can get people to uh, take that to heart and move on that, they can be in somewhat command of their own the future of their own brain. And that's a really important message. Yep, definitely, definitely. Um, Melissa, how about you? How do you envision the film making a difference in the world? Wow, you can ask me that question too. <laughs> um, I feel like we owe it to our families. And by our families, I mean the families we filmed who are also sort of became our families and they're like our own families. Our families and our donors and our crew and the scientists, everyone who opened the door for us and made this possible, we owe it to them that everything's going to be, you know, be a little better because of this film. And what, what, and really basically it's a lot of what Therese said, awareness of health, like how we can maybe stave off dementia for a few years by taking better care of ourselves through physical exercise or eating well, um, how we can be respectful and sensitive to families who are going through a dementia journey and making life easier with dementia friendly practices. And uh, just encouraging people to try research. The uh, one of the biggest needs now in Alzheimer's disease are people to be in clinical trials. So the study that we followed, it's not a clinical trial. It's trying to find out what causes Alzheimer's disease and how to prevent it or slow it down. But really a big need are people to try the new medications that are emerging. And if people have the bravery to do that and realize that they can change the future, that would be amazing. Wouldn't that be just a beautiful piece? And I, and I think you're, I think your film can do all that. I think it's going to engage people. One thing that I do want to mention that is something that I learned in terms of doing those community um, screenings was I would suggest if you can do a series, because what I found was people who saw it wanted to bring someone else back. They, they wanted to expand the conversation. So if you're in one community, um, try to have a couple different screenings spread out, you know, over a month or a quarterly basis or whatever it is. But people were just like, oh, so and so's got to see this, so and so. And they really wanted to have that expanded conversation. And in a lot of places, you know, I was just there for a conference or something and I didn't have that ability to do that. But if you've got that ability, um, I would highly, highly recommend that because I think that's something that you will see from people that they will want to share your work with others because it, it touched them. It, um, it, it gave them hope. It gave them insights and they wanted to share that because they know they can't summarize the whole thing and it's more powerful to watch and, and let them feel it for themselves. So, um, kudos to you and your crew and, um, you know, your stars of the film for being brave enough to share their life stories with us. I, I, I think it makes a huge, huge difference um, to not only your family and the crew, but just our society at large. We need to have these conversations. We need to expose all sides. We need to help people figure out you know, what even is a clinical trial? Because a lot of people don't even know they even exist. I mean, if their doctor doesn't tell them, it's not something that, you know, you think of right away. Oh, let's go, let's go do this. You got too many other things on your list. So it, it, that whole thing to me needs to be broached a little bit different and um, be a little more organized and, and user friendly, you know, for them to be able to step in and, and step up. Now people can go to your website, which is determinedmovie.com, determinedmovie.com. You're also on Facebook. If you use the little at sign at determined, we'll take you right to the, it's the first thing that'll pop up, which, which I did not know. Okay. Um, so recently. So at Determined, you will find it pretty much on social media. We've also listed Therese and Melissa's email if you want to reach out to them directly. 
Um, it is tberry-tanner at hotmail.com for Therese. And Melissa is Melissa, and her last name is spelled G-O-D-O-Y at mac.com ladies again thank you so much for your dedication and work and and sharing this with our with our community here on alzheimer speaks i'm just thrilled to have you here today with us thank you so much Lori. uh thank you for being part of the journey as you mentioned earlier you watched a couple of the rough cuts and provided feedback so you've been support supportive all the way and we really appreciate that and thank you for today thank you and to our listeners, again, like, click, and share, spread the word, and uh, find out how you might be able to see the movie Determined. Thank you.